Hello congregation, family and friends, Bereans. I pray that all is well with you. Thank you for joining me here on the Sunday broadcast. I have to admit to you that I am fired up today. This is a sermon that's been on my spirit for the last few days. And by the way, I, I very rarely cross broadcast this, but here's what I want to say uh, before I get into today's message. For those of you who watch me on Monday nights, you tune in tomorrow night. 7 p.m. Central for the next edition of Monday Night Manor. I've got some things to talk about tomorrow night, but we'll do that then. But I want to welcome you to our Sunday broadcast, and we're going to talk about hearts today. I titled my sermon, Hearts Like Flint, and we'll talk in a couple of minutes about what that means. You know, let's start here. In Jeremiah 17, verse 9, the Bible tells us that the heart is deceitfully wicked. The heart is sick. The heart is deceitfully wicked, and who can know it? Look it up. Each Bible version says something a little different. It's deceitful and desperately wicked. We're sick. Our hearts are sick. And that started with our very first parents, Adam and Eve. And to this very day, to this very moment of this broadcast, our hearts are still sick. They're still sick. Jesus talked many times throughout the Gospels, read them, of things that come out of the heart, blasphemies and murderers and, and adulteries and all of these ugly things. It all starts in the heart. I've explained this to you before. It starts in the heart, goes to the head, comes out the mouth. And we are seeing this left and right in this world, in this turmoiled society that we're living in right now. Well, it's affecting all of us, those of us that have any kind of feeling, these things that are happening in our society, these things that are happening in the world. The fact that we do have uh, systemic racism, the fact that we do have social injustices, we have unequal scales. Well, the Bible talks about things like that. And suddenly there's people that don't want to hear what I have to say. And so I say this up front before I even start this message, and I say this in all honesty. If you don't like what I'm saying, tune me out. If you don't want to hear this message, unfriend me, block me, do whatever you want to do. Get off these channels because I will not be silenced, I will not be stopped, and I will not be quiet anymore. Certain things need to be said, certain things need to be preached, certain things need to come directly from the Word of God. Now, those of you who have followed me for years, you know, you know I do not sugarcoat, I do not tiptoe around the Word of God. I don't duck certain topics. That is not who I am. That is not who God called me to be. I'm a loudmouth. I'm an East Coast guy. I'm a Philadelphian. We say what's on our mind, and we say it with passion. And so if I'm not your kind of preacher, you're free to leave now. Because what I'm about to say is going to offend some people, and I make no apologies for it. Let's get to the Bible here. We're talking about hearts. I want you to turn in your Bibles, or if you're making notes, to the book of Zechariah. Not Zechariah, Zechariah. In case you haven't read it recently, here's where you can find it in the Bible. Go to Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament. Well, Zechariah is right before Malachi. And I want you to go to chapter 7 of Zechariah. And I'm only going to look at a small portion of it. I encourage you, for those of you who have not read through Zechariah, Bereans, if you haven't read through Zechariah recently, you better read it. Because it has a lot to do with today's world and what's happening in today's society and some of the issues that are coming up. We're going to look at some of them today. But in Zechariah, here, let me set some historical context before we actually get to the text. As you go through the Bible, as you go through the Old Testament, and it's still happening today, we saw that God's chosen people, the Israelites, and it happens with us today every time we disobey God. You would see a certain pattern where God was blessing his people. They would wind up rebelling or, or joining another country or another nation and intermixing. And God would have to chastise them. And it came in, in the form, when you read through Judges, it would come in the form of another nation coming against Israel. It would be the Midianites or the Philistines or whoever it was. They would go into captivity or bondage for a while. And then they'd suddenly cry out to the Lord God, and God would have to raise up a judge like Samson, like Gideon, like Jephthah, like Deborah. 
and he would send those judges in to retrieve his people, bring them back to the land, and they would live in obedience to God for a while, and then what would happen? They'd intermix with maybe another nation, they'd say or do something with a false idol, and suddenly God would have to raise up another nation against them and send them right back into captivity. And if you read through the book of Judges, you see this happen over and over and over and over. And we start wondering, what can't these people get it right? There's one God to serve if they would just serve God. Almighty God, Jehovah God, the God of the Bible, and stop messing around with all these other things, don't you think they'd be much better off? But they didn't get it. And you know what? We don't get it either. We get caught up with idols. We get caught up with things that we should, and we take our eyes off of Almighty God. And God has to come down and chastise us. Yes, even in 2020. There are some people who believe that this COVID-19 coronavirus is a judgment of God. I personally do not believe that. I think that's just a result of living in a fallen world that is sick with cancers and diseases and all kinds of things because we have ruined this world because this world is full of sin. So I don't believe it's a specific judgment of God. I'm in the minority as far as the people that I know. Most people think it's a judgment. But I'm going to show you today exactly where God is bringing judgment. And it's just as relevant today as it was back in the Bible here. And so let's go back and this history. We have this history of Israel, the children of God. And I, we're looking at an Old Testament here. Well, in 586 B.C., Jerusalem was captured and Israel was captured by the Babylonians. And Israel was brought into captivity for 70 years in the land of Babylon. If you read the book of Daniel, and you read about Daniel in the lion's den and his three friends in the fiery furnace, all that happened during those 70 years in Babylon. Well, after 70 years, God promised he would retrieve his people, and they started coming back to the land. Well, there were two prophets on hand at that time. One was Haggai, and the other one was Zechariah. They were contemporaries of each other. Now, Zechariah was on the scene as an active prophet, between the years 520 and 516 BC. If you're calculating in your head, we're talking 2,500 years ago. 2,500 years ago, this man Zechariah was on the scene and prophesying what God was giving him. And he said something really ugly to the people that they needed to hear and they didn't hear it and I'm telling you when you look at this passage with me today we are not hearing it either and that's why God is bringing judgment this very day if you're with me we're in Zechariah chapter 7 I want to read a few verses and then look at this we're gonna look at it in context but I want to break it down into several different things that God was doing through his prophet and so we look at verse 8 of Zechariah chapter 7 it says this then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying now a prophet of old was speaking directly for God the Bible had not been completed when God gave a prophet a word it was a true word unlike some of the words going out today from so-called prophets this was a prophet of God the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying look what he says thus has the Lord of hosts said dispense true justice, practice kindness and compassion each to his brother, and do not oppress the widow or the orphan, the stranger or the poor, and do not devise evil in your heart against one another. That is the initial statement from Zechariah to his people. And yes, he was talking to national Israel there, but I submit to you that he's talking to you and he's talking to me right now. Because we're going to look at these two verses and we're going to see, wait a minute, in verse 9 God tells us, what we should do. In verse 10, he tells us what we should not do. And I submit to you that we're not doing any of these things. Because if we were, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in today. Let's go back and look at this. Verse 9, thus saith the Lord of hosts. And if you ever wonder what that phrase means, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of everything. God created everything. He is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the entire universe. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, dispense true justice now we could argue that point. what is true justice person a over here says oh i know what justice is it means xyz and another person says no justice means a b c it doesn't matter what you and i consider justice to be it matters what god considers justice to be and he gives us two hints here in this verse as to how we to dispense 
or apply true judgment and justice. Here's what we do. We're to practice kindness. And we are to have compassion each to his brother. Now I say to you, look around. You look around. You look around the society. You look at how different people are treated in different cultures. And you look at how one person is up here and another person is down here. And you tell me where the compassion is for all of our brothers. And you tell me where kindness is. Now you tell me if we are dispensing true judgment or are we dispensing what we think is true judgment. Are you hearing me? Am I getting through to anyone? Am I the only one that can see this? In this ancient prophecy of 2,500 years ago, I see today's world. I see today. I see yesterday. I see tomorrow when I see people out on the street protesting. It's not what we think. It's what God says. And God has established certain rules of justice and we are not paying attention to them. Oh, am I offending someone? I don't care. Because I've had to face this myself. I've had to look at my own life and what I'm doing and how I treat people and what I'm saying. And I'm saying, Lord, I'm part of the problem too. I need to wake up. I need to realize, I need to wrestle with these texts the same way that you do. We can't just duck them. It's like some people don't want to talk about Judgment Day. Some people don't want to talk about hell. But it's in the Bible and we need to address it and it's here for a reason. And so God is telling us today the same way he told the nation of Israel, dispense true judgment, true judgment, fair judgment, accurate justice. You bring true justice to the people, not what you think, what I say. And there's two ways to do it. Practice kindness and show compassion to all of his brothers. And I submit to you that when we see racism, when we see hatred, when we, when we see the things, we are not, we are not, are you hearing me? We are not showing compassion each to his brother. We're not doing it. And all of us are going to be held accountable before God. None of us are doing it. Am I offending you? I don't care. Because I've had to face this myself. If you're being offended and you don't like what I'm saying, leave. Because I'm not shutting up. Now, he tells us in verse 9 what we should do. Okay? If that's not enough conviction. Let's go to verse 10. Remember, this is what God told us not to do. They weren't supposed to do it then, and we're not supposed to do it now. It says, do not. Do not oppress the widow or the orphan. The stranger or the poor. Don't oppress them. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. Uh-oh, we are all guilty. Why is it that we live in a society? Why is it that we live in a land of plenty and we toss elderly people into nursing homes where they can be abused and neglected? And God is saying, don't oppress them. Don't neglect them. You're to take care of them. That is a biblical principle. Some cultures take better care of their elderly and have respect for the elderly than sometimes we do. Now I'm not saying if you have someone that has terrible medical issues and they need professional help that they need to go in a facility because you're not, uh, you can't care for them. I'm not saying that. I'm saying how often do we just toss off old people? Not long ago, decisions were made as to who lives and who dies based on the coronavirus, based on how much uh, how much help was available to them. And decisions were actually going to be made that if you were over a certain age, they couldn't help you. Are you kidding me? God is telling us, you don't oppress, you don't neglect people. You were talking about the widow and the orphan, the most helpless among us. You know widows, I know widows. Why are there children in orphanages? Why are there children who are not wanted? Why are there children who are being abused? and just being thrown away like yesterday's garbage. Why is that happening? Because we're not paying attention to what God said. That's why. He told us don't do it. He told national Israel, don't do it. 2,500 years ago, and he's now telling us, hey, hello, wake up, stop doing it. And if you think you're gonna get away with it, you're not. Don't oppress the widow or the poor. The stranger, the poor, the widows, the orphans. When's the last time you helped a stranger? 
When's the last time you saw a poor person and actually felt any compassion for them? Yes, we've helped them, but we got to do better. That's right. We need to repent is what we need to do. We need to be on our knees before Almighty God saying, God, we have failed. We have failed. Look at the last thing in verse 10 before we get to what the people's reaction was. Because this is where the real conviction is going to come in at. It says, do not, don't do it. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. Do not devise, think about, come up with, implement, put into practice. Don't devise evil against your brothers. But what do we do? We hold some people down because of the color of their skin. And we elevate other people because of the color of their skin. We look at each other economically. I make more money than you. My house is bigger than you. My wife is more beautiful than yours. We make all of these judgments. I can get to the top because I have a great education. But you, you're going to stay down here and we're not going to give you a chance because you didn't get a great education. Don't devise evil against one another. These are God's words. You mad at me? Take it up with God. Take it up with God. And do not divide races. Do not say, because you're dark and I'm light, that I have more privilege than you. No. That's not the way it works. That's not what God says. God says, don't devise evil in your hearts against one another. It doesn't say, oh, except if they're from a certain part of the world, or they speak a certain language, or they don't have as much education. God doesn't say anything about that. And so, yes, we're all under indictment. And you better be hearing this message. The same way that I had to hear this message. I have been wrestling with this text for the last three days as God has been convicting me. And so I'm just sharing with you what God has showed me. But look what happens. I want you to see if you see yourself in this reaction. Look at verse 11 and 12 now. But they refused to pay attention. They turned a stubborn shoulder. They stopped their ears from hearing. They made their hearts like flint so that they could not hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Let's just stop right there. How many of us are guilty? I'm guilty. How many of us have done this? We refuse to pay attention. Oh, that's uncomfortable. You're not talking about me. Because I'm a good person. I love God. I'm not racist. No, you're not talking about me. I wouldn't harden my heart. No. Come on now. Who, are we going to be honest here? Or are we just going to play around? We don't have time to play around. God is indicting us. He's indicting me. He's indicting you. Are we going to play around? Or are we going to take God for what he's saying here? Zechariah said, these people refused to pay attention. Everything that God had told them, they simply refused. We're not paying attention. I want you to notice how active this is. Because these are activities. Watch this. First of all, they simply refuse to pay attention. We're not going to listen. We're not paying attention. We're not going to do what you say, God. We're not going to do what you say, Zechariah. We're not. But then they did something else. They turned a stubborn shoulder. You know what that means? Here's what would happen. When they would try to place the yoke on the oxen when they were doing their plowing, and when they had oxen, you always had a mature ox and a, and a, a younger ox so that the older one could train the younger one. When you put the yoke on, if the ox didn't want to be yoked, they would turn themselves to try to get away from having the yoke put on them. That's what turning a stubborn shoulder is all about. So not only do we not pay attention, we are actually trying to turn away. We don't, we don't even want to face. We don't want to be locked into what God is saying. And so we turn a stubborn shoulder. Oh, but there's something else, you see. Just in case paying attention doesn't work, just in case a stubborn shoulder doesn't work, look what else they do. We stop our ears from hearing. And so if you are still with me and you're about to turn me off, you're stopping your ears from hearing. You don't want to hear. You're not interested in what God is saying. And lately, I've come across people who I thought were one way and they're another way. Boy, are my eyes being opened. Not only with other people, but with myself. I have to confront things that I thought about. Things that I thought were right. Things that I thought were accurate. And it turns out they're not accurate at all. And when I look at this and I say, Lord, am I stopping my ears? Am I not paying attention? Am I turning myself away from you? Am I trying to run and hide? And the next thing that happens is this. 
They made their hearts like flint. You know what flint is? Flint is a dark, hardened rock. It's just about the most hardened thing you can find. It's hard to even carve an initial in something like flint. What is God telling us here? Our hearts are so hard that they can't even be penetrated. They are hardened like flint is. Not like clay where you can just kind of pull it apart. Not pliable. This is like flint, like a rock. Do we know somebody else from the Old Testament? Oh, there's a lot of people. If you're reading your Bible, Bereans, you've seen a lot of people with hardened hearts. Let me tell you about one of them. If you read through the book of Exodus, there was a prophet of God named Moses. And he was sent to Egypt to free the Israelites. Well, what happened when he went to Pharaoh? Each time he went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, what does the Bible say? Pharaoh hardened his heart. He hardened it like flint. And he wouldn't let the people go. And so a plague would come. And then he'd say, okay, Moses, let's meet again. And Moses would say, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, oh, no, 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 you can't go. He hardened his heart. Second, third plague, fourth plague. That man, it took 10. Are you hearing me? It took 10 plagues for his heart to be unhardened. And guess what? Even then it was only temporary. Because no sooner did the Israelites head out the chariots came following them with Pharaoh and his army to get them back. So was his heart truly unhardened? It was a respite. It was a moment. And then his heart hardened up again. But what happened to Pharaoh? He drowned. He drowned with all of his people right there in the river. And God destroyed them. Are we learning anything here today? Is your heart like Flint? Is my heart like Flint? Can we turn aside with these things that are happening in our world? And things that are happening in our church. We can't, I preached last week, we can't even get along with each other in a church body. How do we expect anything to happen out there in the world if you and I can't get along as brothers and sisters in Christ? Is your heart like flint? Is my heart like flint? It says here their hearts were so hardened that they couldn't even hear the law and the words that the former prophets had brought. These are the prophets that were here before Zechariah. Other prophets, going all the way back to the beginning. Pharaoh didn't want to hear Moses. And the people didn't want to hear Moses when he came down off of that mountain with the Ten Commandments. No, they were too busy building golden idols with Aaron and worshiping false gods. Were they listening then? No. Are we listening anymore now? No. We're not, because the heart is desperately wicked. The heart never changes. God has to change our heart. But if we go upon, oh, my heart is good, I'm a good person. No, you are not. And no, I am not. We're not good people. We are people saved by the grace of God because of what Jesus did. And so Zechariah is telling the people, here's what you do, here's what you don't do. And then he says, but you hardened your hearts. You turned away. You stopped your ears. Now, I, I, I challenge you as I challenge myself. Here's a checklist for all of us. Have you refused to pay attention to the Word of God? Are you turning a stubborn shoulder away because you don't want to hear it? You don't want to face it? You don't want to face what's going on in your life or what you might be thinking? Are you stopping up your ears so you say, I'm not going to listen to Thomas right now and I'm not going to listen to the Word of God and I'm going to shut the Bible because it doesn't apply to me. I'm not a racist. I'm not a hateful person. And yes, Jesus is the answer. He's the only answer. Look what happens now. As if I haven't given you enough already. God says at the end of verse 12, He says, Therefore, since the former prophets, therefore great wrath came from the Lord of hosts. You know what happened? It was when they were sent 70 years into Babylon. Great wrath came upon them. God separated them. He destroyed the nation of Israel. He took them into captivity because they wouldn't do what God told them to do. God pronounced the judgment on his people and he took them away into Babylon. And eventually they were able to come back and start rebuilding the temple. But guess what? As you read through the Old Testament, they even screwed that up. Because then Ezra had to come on the scene and Nehemiah had to come on the scene to motivate and get the people going to rebuild the temple. So that didn't even work. 70 years in Babylon didn't solve their problem because they weren't obeying God. Now here is, if I haven't frightened you enough, 
here's where it really gets scared. This is the verse, and I was talking to Crystal about this. This is the verse that, that just laid me out yesterday. Listen to this, verse 13. And just as he called, and they would not listen. That's God calling his people. Just as he called, and the people would not listen. So they called, and I would not listen, says the Lord of hosts. You hear that? The same way that I called to them. I called out to my people. I'm calling out to you people right now. June, first Sunday in June, 2020. I'm calling out to you people. Are you hearing me? Are you listening to me? Are you going to obey me? Are you going to do things God's way? Or are you going to do things your own way? Are you hearing me? And God is saying there's going to come a time when you're going to call out to me and I'm not going to hear you. Wait a minute. Thomas, are you saying that Almighty God who says to always hear the prayers of his people is actually saying you're going to call out to me and I'm not going to listen. How long did it take the Israelites to get out of Egypt? 400 and some odd years. How long did it take them to be rescued from Babylon? 70 years. If you're 70 or under, the people have been in Babylon since before you were born. Think about it. I'm 59. And they were in 70 years in captivity simply because they wouldn't listen to God. And God is saying there's coming a time, there's coming a time when you're going to reach out to me and I'm not going to hear you. Because just the same way you stopped your ears, I'm going to stop my ears. And when we're crying out to God and he doesn't hear us, how scary is that? So let me put this in modern terms, as if I haven't already. Could it be, could it be that the worldwide protests we see, that finally the fight for racial equality and to knock down the systems of racism that have been in place, and that people are aligning all around the world. I am not talking about the looters. I am not talking about those that, just are, that are out there to take advantage and to destroy property. I'm talking about those people who are peacefully praying and peacefully protesting. Could it be that God is bringing a judgment upon this very world because of how we've treated one another simply because we have not obeyed what God has said? Is it possible? See, when you think about judgment of God, you think about horrible things. Oh, a tsunami, uh, a terrible earthquake, a worldwide flood. We think God only does big things when he's bringing judgment. Well, I submit to you that very, it's very possible that all of these protests going on, that all these people who are righteously indignant, including this preacher right here, if all of that could possibly be a judgment of God where God is saying, look, people, I'm giving you one last chance here. I'm giving you a chance to get your act together. I'm giving you a chance to start showing compassion to one another. Start treating people equally. Start knocking down the systems that should never have been put in place in the first place. Maybe God is saying, I'm sick and tired of you refusing to listen to me, and so I'm going to do something radical. I'm going to do something radical. I'm going to bring attention to the world. I am going to bring peoples from all different lands, from all different languages, from all different cultures, and they're all going to march for the same reason. Is it possible? Is it possible that that's what God is doing? All I can do is look inside my old hardened heart, my own heart like flint, and just repent. And the answer is this. You've got to repent before the living God. We've got to repent before the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to seek forgiveness from God for everything that we've done. Whether it's done out of ignorance, whether it's done maliciously, whether it's done because that's the way you were raised, whatever the situation is, you and I are guilty of stopping our ears, refusing to hear, not wanting to do things God's way. And we are living in a society and a, and a world that is reaping reaping the principle of sowing and reaping we sowed something and now we're reaping it we can't look to God God you didn't God you caused this what kind of a God would do that God didn't do it you did it I did it we did it society did it unfair rules not true justice not showing compassion not taking care of our widows and orphans and the poor and the strangers and those that are infirm we all did it and it just built and built and built. And now we're seeing this worldwide revolt. Not the, not, the, not the criminal element. The true people that want true justice. 
this is the last thing I'll say. You and I better get on our knees and repent before Almighty God, before it's too late, before He says one day to us, uh, you're talking, you're praying, I don't hear you anymore. I'm done listening. I gave you enough chances. Work it out for yourself. I'm no longer listening. I called out to you, you didn't hear me. Now you're calling out to me, I don't hear you. My celestial ears are stopped up. If we get to that point, we've lost everything. If we lose God, we've lost everything. Repent today. Jesus Christ is the answer. If you're listening to this message and Jesus is not your Lord and Savior, He can be today, right now. You can accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Don't let another day go by where you're not sure of your salvation. Jesus came into this world to die for those who would believe in Him, to those who would sacrifice themselves. He gave His sacrifice on the cross of Calvary so that you and I wouldn't have to pay the penalty, so that you and I, if we are truly saved and truly born again, we have eternal life in heaven with Jesus forevermore. And one day we will be back on the new heaven and the new earth, read the end of Revelation. It won't have wickedness in it, no racism, no sin, no hatred. No sickness, no disease, no death. None of that's going to be here in the new heaven and new earth. But we are living here now in a sin-cursed world. And we need to do individually, collectively, as a church, as a church body, as brothers and sisters, we have an obligation to stand up to the evils of this world and we have to say something. I'm just one little pastor here, one little preacher on a broadcast. But I'm going to do everything that I can do to raise awareness of these issues. I hope, I hope that somewhere along the way you got convicted. I hope somewhere along the way that today you make that decision that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Because if you leave tonight, if you leave this world, if you die tonight in an unsaved state, there's no eternal life for you. There's no forgiveness for sin. So I implore you today, Jesus is the answer. If we use Jesus as a role model, how he treated people, how he cared for people, all of these things that Zechariah was saying not to do, we wouldn't be doing them anymore. We'd be doing what Jesus did. We'd be taking care of the widows and orphans and the poor and the strangers. We wouldn't be devising evil against one another. Where do you stand today? Are you mad at me? Good. Did I upset you? Here's what I want to say. Isaiah 55:11 says this. That the word of God does not return void. It reaches all those people he intends it to reach. So if it reached you today, if it reached you today, if this convicted you today, if it made you get into the scriptures, drop to your knees, accept Jesus, if it made you more aware of maybe you're holding on to a couple of thoughts and a couple of attitudes that you should get rid of, if it did anything, then this message was meant for you today. That's what that means. The word of God will not return void. It reaches all those people he intends it to reach. Here's what I ask you to do. If this message spoke to you today, if you know someone that needs to hear this encouraging message today, and this message of indictment from God, but a message also of encouragement that we could turn this around, then I want you to share this video with every single person you can. Because this is the word of God. It has nothing to do with me. This is God's word going out. This is a word for today. This is a revelation word today for our circumstances today. You can't just look at a book like Zechariah and say, well, that was written thousands of years ago. It doesn't apply to me. Oh, yes, it does. And I just showed you how. So share this. Bereans, if you're on here, and I can't see everybody that's on here right now, we call ourselves, our little Facebook group, we call ourselves Bereans for Life. You know why? Because in Acts 17, 11, God says that the Bereans, um, yes, this message is also on my Facebook page. Thank you for asking for that. Thank you for all the hearts here over on Periscope. Uh, it is available. Uh, so here, the Bereans, the God said that they were more noble than all others in Acts 17, 11. That doesn't mean they were smarter. They weren't nicer off. They didn't have this, uh, you know, I'm in a richer category than you. No. Here's what they did. It says that they searched the scriptures daily to make sure what they heard was true. They received the word with all readiness. Read it. Acts 17, 11. They were eager to hear the word. They didn't stop their ears. They didn't throw a stiff shoulder. They wanted to hear, but they did one step further. They then went to the scriptures the Bible itself to make sure what Paul was telling them and what Silas was telling them was the absolute truth. You need to do the same thing. I encourage you, do your research in the scriptures. Spend time in the Bible. Be a diligent Berean. Go over this passage and go over it and study it for yourself and see if what I've said to you is true.
That's all I ask. If you've heard nothing else from me, you be a diligent Berean. In our little group on Facebook, we call ourselves Bereans for Life because we've made a commitment to be in the Scriptures every single day. Last thing.